this is a session that I have been looking forward to and I know a lot of other people have been looking forward to ever since we said we were coming to Turkey and we were talking at the source of wine that everyone said, ah, you should get these people and thankfully they were on our list and they decided they would come. So here they are and um, I shall let Dr. Patrick introduce himself. Okay, I'm delighted to be here. This is a great topic to talk about and uh, in the right place. And uh, of course, Turkey uh, has a spectacular wine culture, which uh, is, uh, for those people who've uh, traveled around uh, Turkey, which I assume many of you have, the, uh, I think the museum in Ankara is, uh, is really the epitome of a wine vessel museum. I mean, it's like you're looking at the largest collection of wine vessels ever assembled. So uh, I'll say a little bit about my introduction, too. I guess I left that out. Uh, I'm a chemist and an archaeologist, so what I'll be doing is giving a, uh, a perspective on ancient wine that looks at it from both points of view, and then that'll lead into Josie Villamoza's uh, talk about the DNA evidence that we have for ancient grapes and uh, the heritage and so forth. So I'll, I'll leave that for him to talk about. Meanwhile, I'll talk about chemistry and archaeology. So here we've got some archaeological artifacts, uh, which... Uh, go back to the third millennium BC, so this is like 5,000 years ago, uh, from Alajahuyuk out in central Anatolia. And it's quite likely that, you know, a jug like this that has the, the bird uh, beak spout, uh, you know, which is easy to pour with, and also uh, looks like a raptor. It, it, it apparently, you know, represents some kind of a bird, probably a raptor, and a lot of the early uh, evidence we have for the religion of Anatolia involves uh, the, the goddess especially being draped uh, with an eagle or a vulture. And so these vessels might well represent that, but they're also part of a drinking set. And, uh, and then if we come down to the second millennium BC, you can see that again we have very spectacular uh, uh, beak spouted uh, uh, vessels. And uh, these are, you know, very high gloss red slipped ware which replicates uh, silver, well, gold and silver. I mean, the first ones we see there, you know, the ones from Al-Jahuk from the third millennium are, are gold, for sure. But then if you take pottery, you can also make imitations of that, and that uh, is often done uh, uh, then in pottery. The, um, so how did this, you know, wine culture that we see represented in Anatolia come about? And the first uh, real evidence I was involved with uh, for Turkey was a tomb out at the site of Gordian, which involved wine. So this is a, a tomb. Uh, it might look just, just like a natural hillock. And this is the, the capital city of the Phrygians. And this uh, hill, or hillock, is uh, called the Midas Tumulus. And it has a, a tomb that's essentially hermetically sealed right here at the center bottom buried under layers of stone and soil. So after they put the, the individual who had deceased into that tomb, they then covered it over with these multiple layers. It's sort of, sort of like a tell. And the University of Pennsylvania excavated this back in 1957, and it turned out to be really a spectacular tomb, which um, probably belongs to uh, one of the kings of Phrygia. And uh, as the name suggests uh, Midas is one possibility. It, uh, they had to cut through the walls of the tomb. The tomb had double logs defining the uh, perimeter and also the ceiling and floor. And so this is sort of like going into King Tut's tomb. You know, you have to cut a, a hole through the, the logs. And then that enabled them to look into the tomb and they had a uh, a male, 60 to 65 years old, lying on a very thick accumulation of textiles and felt. Uh, I could go into detail on some of the colors that were there, but as, as light and air you know, came streaming into the tomb, the red and uh, blue colors of those textiles, you could actually see them fading according to the excavators, which is you know, a shame. But uh, you know, after being sealed up for 2,700 years, this, the date of this is about 700 to 750 BC. It uh, has this uh, drinking set in the back. This is the largest Iron Age drinking set that's ever been found. 160 bronze vessels. 
And uh, this is what, you know, very much excited me. It, uh, if you look at some of the vessels, some are large cauldrons for making a beverage, others are drinking vessels, bowls and so forth, and some are quite uh, beautifully uh, made uh, buckets or citulae that they could dip into the cauldron and bring out the, uh, the beverage. And so in this tomb we had represented a, a funerary feast. Uh, it included a beverage and there was uh, residue in, the, uh, in some of these vessels, m many of them actually. And, uh, and then there was also other pottery jars that had residue that represented the entree that went with the beverage. So the entree, I won't go into a lot of details, a barbecued lamb or goat stew with lentils and, and he heavily spiced, you know. Uh, so, but it's really the beverage that we're, we were interested in. And this is a close-up view of some of the residues uh, that we're looking at. This is probably the easiest excavation I was ever on because uh, the Penn excavators had the foresight to bring the residues back in 1957. And they were sitting in the original paper bags they'd been collected in two flights above my uh, laboratory. So all I had to do is walk up the stairs, you know, get the samples, and then we started doing the uh, analyses. And you'll see that it has a very golden look to it. Now, there isn't a sign that says this is Midas's tomb. Uh, it could be his father, Gordius, but the, there is a real King Midas, and we have textual evidence from Assyria and other ancient kingdoms of his rule. And in any case, this is a royal tomb. It's like the most prominent feature at the site, if you ever go to Gordian, and you can go right into the tomb, or at least you were able to. Uh, and uh, the artifacts are actually in the Ankara Museum, if you're interested in seeing those. Now, the analyses that we carried out in this residue uh, combined a lot of different uh, techniques. And, you know, for the chemically challenged, I won't give you all the, uh, the breakdown of all the compounds, but I'll just talk about some of the basic ones. Uh, tartaric acid, uh, we were able to identify with techniques like infrared spectrometry, liquid chromatography, uh, mass spectrometry, and so forth. Uh, if you find tartaric acid in a residue, this points to grape or a grape product. And uh, since these vessels were obviously used for some kind of a drink, uh, it was a juice, a grape juice that is represented, uh, tartaric acid being uh, found in large amounts only in grapes in the Middle East. Uh, other parts of the world, it varies. But if you have a juice, a liquid, that's uh, got yeast, of course, associated with it on the uh, outside of some of the grapes. And that, in a warm climate particularly, that'll start to ferment very quickly. So it's, it's very difficult to take grape juice in the Middle East and keep it from going to, to wine. And the real question is, how do you keep the wine from going to vinegar? Uh, I mean, you might want to have some vinegar, but uh, the mind-altering uh, effects of wine and the whole way it got integrated into human culture is what really is what people are after. Uh, so then, you know, as well as... Uh, grape wine, it had uh, evidence for beeswax. There are very distinctive compounds uh, that beeswax had, and you never can filter all the beeswax out of honey. And again, honey has yeast associated with it. So if you dilute that honey, 80% water, 20% uh, honey, uh, those yeasts will become active and change it into mead. So that was another component that was involved. And then finally, there's something called beer stone. Uh, I guess you're all wine people, but the beer people uh, are very familiar with beer stone. It's a very bitter, uh, even poisonous substance that accumulates on the inside of uh, fermentation vats, and you have to scrape it out. It's a yellowish material, very simple compound, uh, but it is called beer stone because it settles out during the fermentation process, and that's often associated with uh, barley beer. So, in essence, we had a combination, and, and when we made this discovery back in 2000, and it was the cover story of nature, uh, you know, we were kind of amazed uh, that people were mixing together wine, beer, and mead. You know, who ever heard of doing such a thing? I mean, now it's fairly commonplace, and of course, if you start looking back through historical records, in the Middle Ages, there's something called a braggot uh, that mixes things together, and going much further back, we find out that humans generally mix uh, all kinds of sugar sources together to get fermentation, different flavors, et cetera. Um, but this is what might happen to you if you drank a little too much of the, the Midas uh, beverage. And so that got me thinking that maybe we should do some uh, 
experimental archaeology. And at the time, we used to have a, a beer writer named Michael Jackson that would come to our museum. This is not the entertainer, but the, uh, the Scotch maven and beer enthusiast. And they had a dinner the night before. And so I sort of put out a challenge to all the microbrewers who were in the audience. You, know, you could come down to my laboratory the next morning at 9 AM. And I'll explain this in detail to you. And you can go back to your breweries and try to. See, brewers tend to be extremely experimental. You know, I've proposed this to winemakers, but they're not always ready to go for it. Uh, so the next morning, I had like uh, 25 microbrewers on the doorstep of my, my laboratory, which was quite surprising because, you know, they've been up all night probably, carousing. And they all went back and they started making up these experimental brews and sending them to me. And my job was to taste them. They said they'd just arrive at my doorstep, and I would, you know, take them in and, you know, do a taste. And uh, it ultimately, it turned out that uh, we did a recreation of the whole feast at the Penn Museum in uh, 2000. And this is the label that we used. Uh, it's uh, become a very popular beverage in the United States, at least. It's won more uh, tasting awards, gold tasting awards, which is quite appropriate than any other of the brewery's uh, beverages. And that's Dogfish Head Brewery in Delaware, which uh, we've done a whole series now of recreations of ancient beverages. So it's, uh, you'll notice here, besides the, uh, the grapes, we use Muscat grapes because of the genetic association with early uh, development of domesticated grapes. Uh, also the honey, and in this original uh, version, I mean, we used just the best honey, you know, thyme honey. Uh, I don't know if it was from Turkey. But then the question was, what do we use as the bittering agent? Because we cannot use hops. Hops are much, much later. And so because the residue looks so golden, I said, well, why don't we use saffron? And, you know, saffron is one of those spices that Turkey is so famous for. Uh, going way back into antiquity and has such distinctive flavors and aromas that uh, it, it really worked very well. Uh, but let's go back a little bit earlier. Uh, earlier in Anatolian uh, history, let's look at some of the wines. I've, uh, this is only 700 BC, but you know what was going on before that? Um, and this uh, is uh, some representations of one of the Hittite uh, kings, which um, uh, uh, simply Loomis, who actually came out with the, the statement, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. And uh, you can see here a god uh, down in the southern part of Anatolia uh, carved into a cliffside to Huntus, uh, the wine god, you could say, who's got you know, grape clusters all around uh, his belt. And uh, the, a lot of this evidence I'm presenting here is, is, is uh, summarized in my books on ancient wine and uncorking the past. Um, and uh, we can go back even earlier than the Hittite uh, empire and uh, back to the Neolithic period when we have uh, sites that have uh, emerged when the uh, dams were put in and the, you had to have salvage uh, operations. And we do have uh, a number of sites out here in eastern Anatolia like uh, Chayanu which has wild grape seeds going back to 9,000 BC. Uh, the sites that particularly interest me are the ones here in the square brackets, Navali Chori and Gebekli Tepe. Um, Holland Chemi is quite early. These go back to 8,500 BC. Uh, and you know, they represent some of the earliest Neolithic settlements in the Near East. And when these were uh, discovered, uh, you, know, you could look at the terrain and you could say, oh, well, that doesn't look like any place that would be used for, for grapes, you know, for growing grapes and making wine. But uh, you sort of have to imagine, like we heard from uh, uh, Joel Butler this morning, you know, is that this, uh, this uh, soil, the terra rasa soil that's limestone derived and is high in iron and so forth, actually could uh, support you know, very good uh, vineyards. And even though we don't see any there today, uh, we have to sort of use our imagination um, but these sites have produced uh, some of the uh, most spectacular, earliest examples of three-dimensional sculptures on pillars and columns, uh, showing you know, very realistically different animals, like uh, here we have an oryx, wild bull, uh, here's uh, some sort of a, 
a goose, maybe, and a fox here. And then also representations of, uh, of human figures that are clearly uh, have some sort of symbolic significance, like this is a male head, on the back of which there's a snake writhing up and down it. Um, and what we are working on presently, and we do have techniques now that we're going to apply to this, uh, that are much more precise because, I mean, the, the movement of chemical analysis in this ancient field of biomolecular archaeology really is moving forward very quickly, is uh, organics that we derive not from pottery. Pottery tends to be our main uh, material that absorbs liquids and that we can extract uh, ancient organics from, but from these vessels that go back to the, the 8,000 to 9,000 B.C. early Neolithic settlements, which are made of chlorite, which is a clay mineral that, again, is very highly absorbent. And we've derived a lot of ancient organic material from those, and we're going to be using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry uh, with a, an orbit trap uh, detector, which you know, really is so precise in getting the molecular weight of the compounds of interest. And you can see that these uh, vessels could have very well been used for liquids and for wine. And, uh, they have very strange, uh, you know, probably religiously uh, connected themes, uh, like here, you know, two individuals dancing with a turtle. You know, maybe this is some sort of celebration related to a, a wine festival. You know, we don't know. Uh, this one is from Georgia, and uh, again, it shows a person with you know, the hands upraised. Now, this is made out of pottery dating around 6,000 B.C., but it's some of the earliest uh, possibly wine-related uh, uh, pottery from Georgia, and uh, if you look closely, you can see little blobs of clay here that could represent uh, uh, grape clusters coming down. So this is what we really have got to focus on and see if we can get you know, solid evidence uh, of tartaric acid in particular, and uh, that's one of our current projects. But the, the basic idea that we've sort of come to, and which you'll hear more from jo Josie about, is that we get a, uh, a wine culture, and we have evidence, like I just showed, of you know, possible wine-related artifacts. But you know, from later periods, you know, we have more grape seeds. We have more vessels that are clearly wine-related uh, emerging in the mountainous area of the Near East. So this includes uh, the area of uh, Georgia, Armenia in the Caucasus, Transcaucasia, and then eastern Turkey, which I just talked about, these early Neolithic sites, and then, uh, Haj well, this area of northwest Iran, uh, the north, northern Zagros Mountains. So this is the area where there seems to be a wine culture emerging, perhaps as early as 6,000 B.C., that then spreads um, ultimately down to the Jordan Valley around 4,000 B.C., then on to Egypt, where there was no grapes growing. There was no wild grapes in Egypt. So they had to transplant the, grape, the domesticated grapevine from place to place. And this you know, took some time. But if you assume that it's about 6,000 BC up here, it moves down here uh, to the Nile Delta around 3,000 BC. And the same thing is happening on the other side of the Fertile Crescent. So by 3,000 BC, we have the grape uh, and vessels uh, represented in Shiraz. Um, now, these are some more shots of the, the great Hittite Empire around 1500 BC, where the capital city of Bo Boazkoi uh, is, has storerooms filled with these very tall pithoi that probably contain wine. Uh, the text mentioned uh, extensive vineyards uh, around the site of Boazkoi, which is the capital of the Hittites. And then again, uh, very symbolic scenes of, from some of these beautiful Raitan uh, vessels, which uh, are made, this one's made out of silver. It's in the Metropolitan Museum. And around the, uh, the top of the vessel, you can see this symbolic scene of a, a ruler probably, um, you know, this just died, but there's a ruler there with a cup in his hand. And uh, this is a standard motif for the ancient Near East, where the king is usually holding a glass of wine as he presents it to the gods. And of course, the, the idea was you always g gave the, the gods as much wine, you know, poured out in libation as you possibly could before you indulged yourself. Um, and then you can see the, uh, 
the raptor bird, which is, uh, again, very characteristic of Anatolia. And uh, then the scenes of, uh, there's the, uh, the beak spouted uh, vessel, and some liquid is being poured as a libation on the ground. Uh, there's a sort of snake lurking behind the tree over here, maybe sort of a Garden of Eden motif. Um, but this, I think, you know, Eastern Anatolia, really because of these early Neolithic sites, holds out a tremendous amount of promise in getting um, more definite evidence of where the domesticated grape uh, first occurred and where the earliest wine might have been made. Because we have three of the eight Neolithic founder plants. This is um, chickpea, bitter vetch, and einkorn wheat uh, that come from this area. And uh, our earliest evidence of, of wine so far, chemically based, is uh, from northwest Iran, the site of Haji Firuz, where there were six of these uh, jars, <clears throat> uh, you know, about 40 liters of wine in just an ordinary household. And if you multiply that across the whole Neolithic site, we're talking about a lot of wine. And where you've got a lot of wine, that suggests domestication of the grape, because the domesticated grape enables you, um, and these are also stoppered, which is interesting, which is, you know, one way of uh, preserving uh, the wine from going to vinegar. Uh, they also put a tree resin in, uh, pine resin, terebinth resin, that has antioxidative uh, properties that keeps it from going to vinegar. Uh, but the main reason for domesticating the grape, and you know, Josie will get into this more too, is that it is uh, able to produce more fruit on a p predictable basis because it's hermaphroditic. It has the male and female on the same flower. So you don't have to depend on some insect or the wind, you know, moving the pollen between separate male and female plants. It's right on the same plant. And as far as we know, uh, Vetus vinifera is the only grape species that was ever domesticated. Um, and I'll, I'll let uh, Josie talk about this more. But uh, there's lots of species of grapes. I mean, China has maybe 25 species, North America 25 species, but none of those, to our knowledge, according to the archaeological chemical data, have, were ever domesticated. So 99.5% of our wine that we have in you know, the 10,000 varietals or whatever the number is, um, you know, come from Vetus uh, vinifera uh, being domesticated. And then, then, of course, you have to assume that people at a very early date learned a lot of horticultural methods, too, to be able to transplant the grapevine by taking cuttings, roots, or whatever. And, um, you know, that, uh, there's a whole prehistory, you know, it, it's involved here in domesticating the grape, learning about all the horticultural methods, working out the pottery that you're going to use to make the wine in, uh, and it's, uh, it's a fairly complicated procedure, and, and then selecting, you know, for color and uh, thin skins and what have you that are more suitable for winemaking. Um, so that shows the hermaphroditic uh, grape, uh, and, and we sometimes refer to this uh, origin of uh, the domesticated grape as the Noah hypothesis, uh, the idea being that there is a single place uh, in time where the grape was domesticated. So this refers back to the story about Noah landing on Mount Ararat and the uh, first thing he did was plant a vineyard and subsequently got a little drunk and uh, you know, led to problems. But um, so this Noah hypothesis is what, is what we're really looking at and we're sort of trying to you know, find uh, the vinicultural you know, Garden of Eden, you might say, uh, and uh, this is just a shot of Mount Ararat with uh, an Iron Age site in the foreground. Um, and then uh, they're still growing grapes in the vicinity of this. So, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't hold to the, the Noah story uh, as a literal fact, but of course it, uh, it might have a, some kernel of, of truth to it. And it's just a, it's like the Eve hypothesis, you know, trying to, you know, say, well, humans, you know, probably originated in Africa, you know, whether they're, you know, whether we could identify the first Eve or whatever, or whether there are multiple Eves, we don't know. But the, the main idea here is that you've got a tremendous uh, <clears throat> spread of the wild grape, Eurasian grape. Um, uh, the purple area here shows where the wild grape grows today, and we assume at around 10,000 BC, uh, it's approximately the same distribution. So you can see it going around the coastal areas, extending down into Lebanon, but not getting to Egypt, and then going over to Haji Firuz. 
Now, at Haji Fruz, you, you were hypothesizing they probably were using a domesticated grape. We don't know that for sure. It could be wild grape. But if you're going to produce a lot of wine, you want to domesticate it. So uh, somewhere in that general area and then up into Georgia, Armenia, is where the grape could have been domesticated. And this is the area of the greatest genetic variability for the grape. And it, uh, you know, see, and like I say, the, the wine culture emerges in this area. So, uh, you know, the question is, you know, how do we find out and get more evidence about this? Uh, we can go and collect grapes in Iran. I'm, I'm thinking about doing that. I haven't, uh, I guess we've talked about going to Iran, but we haven't done that as yet. Uh, and I do have a lot of contacts there. And Shiraz would be a nice area to find out more about. Uh, and then up into Georgia, which uh, there's some people from Georgia here represented, uh, where we do have uh, quite, a, quite good evidence of early domesticated grape. Um, and then eastern Turkey. Uh, so here we are in eastern Turkey uh, looking for wild grapevines. And uh, you know, this is kind of a dangerous uh, pursuit. I, I might just say that uh, uh, right after this picture was taken, where I guess Josie will get into this more too, there, we had uh, isolated a hermaphroditic uh, grapevine right there, a wild hermaphroditic grapevine. There were wild male and females on each side of it appropriately. And uh, right after this picture was taken, I nearly fell into the Tigris River here. It was in the spring, and there was a torrent of water, you know, streaming down. And uh, I didn't have the right shoes on, I don't think. And I almost, you know, came pretty close to falling in. And I had to climb back out, a very steep incline. Um, I already mentioned that some of this early evidence from Georgia, um, which has these scenes of somebody dancing or whatever. and then. We do have what appear to be domesticated type grape seeds that go back uh, to 6000 BC from uh, uh, Shulaveri, uh, Gora, which um, is very suggestive. But then you can't really base everything on the shape and uh, length, uh, width of the, of the grape seed. Um, I mean, the elongated one is normally thought to be the domesticated one. And then the wild one is a little shorter and broader. But actually, Pinot Noir has the wild type grape seeds. So you have to be kind of careful about, uh, of course, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about Pinot Noir. Maybe this you know, all fits together. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> so it also, in Georgia, you have this quevery uh, making the wine underground. And uh, there's been some recent uh, discoveries related to this. I mean, I had long thought that the quevery tradition only went back to maybe uh, 700 BC, you know, not 8,000 BC, because the earliest we have evidence from Urartian sites uh, in that region uh, that are about 800 BC. But then in Armenia, uh, they found a cave uh, called Areni, and this cave dates to about 3,000 BC, and it has um, platforms for stomping the grapes. So you've got the plastered uh, uh, stomping ground, and then it, it leads into underground uh, pottery jars. Uh, they're called kara in Armenian, but this is very similar to the quevery idea. And, um, and there's also to, uh, tomb groups right nearby, so there's some association between the tombs and the wine. Um, and you know, maybe more exploration in Georgia will show that it goes back earlier, too. Uh, so I started with Midas. I'd like to end with Midas. Uh, I mean, we have a... Uh, you know, this marvelous uh, renaissance of, of, of uh, Turkish winemaking, and, uh, uh, you know, we don't know where it's headed. So this is the head of Midas, and uh, this is reconstructed from the skull that was in the tomb. And, uh, you know, each time we take a taste of uh, wine uh, at this conference, you know, I, I think of it like a, a liquid time capsule. It's encapsulating you know, what uh, history lies behind the grape and the winemaking techniques, and there's still a great deal more to, to find out. I'll turn the floor over now to, to Josie. Thank you, Patrick, for, the, for this excellent talk. I'll try to follow up with mine. Um, hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation by the organizers and the support of Wines of Turkey. Uh, I'm a grape geneticist. I've worked at the University of California in Davis, and then in Italy, and then in Switzerland. Um, I will talk about the source of wine, which is the title of this 
topic today. And I will focus on grape domestication and also the evolution of grape varieties. So starting with grape domestication, Patrick already told some words about that. Um, this is what we call the Paleolithic hypothesis. Why domesticate the grapevine? Uh, it has not um, much nutritive uh, qualities. It is difficult to reach because the grapevine is a, li li is a liana and it climbs up the trees, so you have to reach them. Maybe some Neolithic people saw the birds eating the berries and they were curious about that and they wanted to do the same. So they did and probably they gathered some berries, some bunches together, maybe more than needed. They would just leave them in a, in a crevice or um, in some containers. With the, the weight, the, the juice would exude. And you know that um, yeast, fermentation yeast, do exist on the berries and also in the air. So th these are the yeast fermenting the wine. So we can imagine that this juice has fermented. And the people who have gathered this, probably it was a um, woman rather than a man because they were hunter-gatherers and women were the ones who gather the food. So probably this woman, which is represented here, I couldn't find a good picture, uh, became inebriated and it's the reason why they wanted to start again. So serendipitous inebriation might be the basics behind grape domestication. And this is serious. As Patrick told you, 99.9% um, of the wines in the world are made from Vitis vinifera, which is divided into two subspecies, the Silvestris one, which is the wild type, and vinifera, which is the cultivated type. So probably through one or several domestication events, it gave birth to the eight or 10,000 of wine grape varieties that we have today. Um, and it gives this wine or this one. You can choose your side. <laughs> so wild grapevine and cultivated grapevines have one big difference. Wild grapevines are dioecious, which means you have plants that are only male in the flowers and plants with only female in the flowers. While cultivated Grapevines are hermaphroditic. They have male and female in the same flower, as Patrick told you. And this is a luck for us. Otherwise, we would not have so much harvest every year. But in the nature, we can observe the reverse of this. Two or three percent of wild grapes are hermaphroditic. And two percent of cultivated grapes are dioecious. Um, there is one in Armenia, for example, where people empirically take male plants and go above the female with the pollen and they pollinate it without knowledge of breeding. They just do it for tradition. And we think that this is the starting point of grape domestication. Why? Because if you domesticate a male plant, you will never have berries, so you would just abandon it. If you domesticate a female plant, and you don't have a male in the neighborhood, you will not have berries and you will leave it out. If you domesticate a hermaphroditic plant, you will have berries every year and you will want to keep it and keep it through cuttings or layerings, uh, methods that are known since ancient times. So the hermaphroditic hypothesis is behind the grape domestication. Here, another picture at the same place. It's also near the Tigris River. Uh, I guess that Patrick took the picture, or maybe Ali Ergul, our friend. And this is me finding a hermaphroditic plant. I'm trying to do the sign, you know, a mixture of the male and female sign with my hands because he was far away. And it, we had the rumor of the Tigris River. So we talk about domestication. There are primary centers of domestication here in this area, and probably secondary domestication centers. I will not develop this today. Uh, many people are studying this and some evidence came from Spain or Italy or southern France of secondary domestication events. But this is still debated in the scientific co community, so I will not um, go any longer on this one. The consensus 
idea of the center of origin for the grape domestication is Transcaucasia, the region between Great and um, Great Caucasus and uh, uh, smaller Caucasus. But after our research in genetics, archaeology, linguistics, we suggest that one of the best candidates for grape domestication center is southeastern Anatolia, uh, basically the region between the Tigris and Euphrates. You can find a little bit of promotion. You can find all the details uh, of what happened between the beginning and, let's say, Jesus Christ in Patrick's book. I strongly recommend to read that. Everything is summarized in this book. And this area, southeastern Anatolia, is at the top of the fer Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is this area here which saw the domestication of founder crops like wheat, like einkorn, pea. Oh. oh, it's working. Yeah, I think it's working. And it's in this region, especially here, which is Karachada uh, in southeastern Anatolia, they found archaeological remains of seven founder crops. So these people were the first one to domesticate crops and to uh, become sedentar sedentarian population. So uh, they had the capacity to domesticate s some, some plants. So why not grapevine? And this area, this is a nice picture. The color is not nice, but the, this is interesting. They have dated the um, plant remains with C14 carbon. They have the, um, dated the plant remains in archaeological sites. And here in this area, which is the Fertile Crescent, they all date back to 8,000 BC. And later, uh, further up, 7,000, 6,000, and so on, 5,000, and so on. So it, it's like, it, it's like uh, the, um, the, the Russian uh, puppets, you know? Uh, if you start from here in, in layers, you go up here. So these remains point to this area and this period for um, the domestication of many crops, probably grapevine too. It's interesting to take a look at languages. This is what we call glottochronology, which is the chronology of languages. And some people, Australian people, have done uh, this genealogical tree of the Indo-European languages. And it's very interesting to see that, uh, well, Romans would have French, this would have uh, German and English and so on. And they have dated every single difference between the languages uh, was counted like a DNA mutation, if we speak about DNA, and they could date the divergence period of the languages, which is really interesting. And if you go back here, 8,007 years ago, you have the Hittite, which is um, extant language of ancient Anatolia. And also Patrick spoke about the Hittite Empire, which was very important at that time. So linguistics confirms the Anatolian origin of crop cultivation. And if we look at the word wine, this is a simplified map of, uh, of uh, the word wine in different languages. If you speak Spanish, vino, French, vin, uh, Italian, vino, oinus, and so on, they all um, point at the proto indo european root, vino, also in yang, in inu, and so on. Also Georgian, vino. But if you make this genealogical tree of languages with what I showed you before, the Hittite here, these are not Indo-European languages, and this is Australian. They have all a common root, so the word wine might be more ancient than Indo-European birth of the language. So we go back to the emergence of language. I think you can read it. Started there. Okay, so what we, we, we've done with Patrick is that we wanted to make a joint project um, joining archaeology and genetics. And the genetic part was to sample wild and cultivated grape vines in this area and compare them. And compare the cultivated varieties with the wild varieties to see in which place they were the most closely related, which would, would point the place of grape domestication. So we took a lot of samples in Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, uh, 
we also took some samples from uh, Central Europe. We've been there together. So here, this is the, the Tigris River running here. This is a wild grape grapevine growing. There are plenty of them in this area. And this is the sources of the Tigris. And here's a representation of Satan at the gates of the Garden of Eden. So it was just, you see, it's almost the same. It was just <laughs> behind here. But unfortunately, we just stopped there because we are serious scientists. We didn't want to go to the Garden of Eden. So we still don't know what's in the garden. Sorry, can't tell you. So what we've done, basically, uh, we worked with genetic grouping. When you have a DNA profile, you have numbers. If you have only one, it's useless. You, you need to have many different profiles. And then you compare them together. You compare the numbers. And you can cluster them together. And for example, if you take uh, Swiss people, Irish people, Japanese people, they would cluster together that way. Every, every square is uh, one person. So if you think of grapes, every square would be a grape variety. And then you have a sample and you want to know in which group it goes. So just take these two people, for instance. I'm sure that I will go with the Swiss people. I'm almost sure that Patrick would go with the Irish people unless you have some Japanese mother that I don't know of. Norwegian. Norwegian, Norwegian, okay. But not Japanese, certainly. No, no, not Japanese. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, so just to explain that you, we want to group the profiles together. So that's what we've done. We had 136 cultivated and 137 wild grapes samples, and we tried to cluster them together. Here you see the wild grapes of Europe are completely distinct from the cultivated grapes of, of Europe, the red clusters. The wild from Georgia and Armenia are also outside the wild of uh, the cultivated grape varieties of these same countries. And the only country in which the wild type and the cultivated type are clustered together was Turkey, especially eastern, southeastern Anatolia. So based on that, and you see that some European cultivar are also clustered in this. Based on this, the genetics would say that the best place or the, the best candidate for grape domestication center would be southeastern Anatolia. This has been confirmed recently by this excellent work by um, Miles and colleagues, which used a, a new technique. I couldn't use it back then together with Patrick because it did not exist. It is SNP, SNPs, which is single nucleotide polymorphism. And they use that to cluster the grape together. And same here, you have all the cultivated in color. All these letters are wild grapes. This is from Spain. This is from uh, Sardinia, Italy, and so on. And here, you have the cultivated from Turkey that are mixed together. So the, the, the green one are cultivated from Turkey, and TR means wild grape from Turkey. So once again, with a different technique, they came to the same conclusion that the most um, likely place of grape domestication is southeastern Turkey. Uh, this is um, evidenced by grape genetics, by linguistics, and by archaeology. For example, in Chayanu, as Patrick said before. But let's not forget our Georgian friends, because it remains a candidate for maybe another domestication center, or at least the origin of the wine culture that we did not find as much in southeastern Anatolia. Because grape genetics links some of them to Europe. I will show you before, after that. Linguistics, we can think of the word wine in Kartvelian, which is maybe the original word that spread out to the rest of the world. And also uh, bio biomolecular archaeology with the Shulaveri uh, site that Patrick has been analyzing. So, it's difficult. We have, we have our best hypothesis, but it's difficult to say it is southeastern Turkey and let's forget the other places. Uh, it needs more uh, work to have a firm conclusion. Here, we've done uh, a work together with Patrick, with uh, other colleagues, about characterization and relationships of grape varieties uh, from this area. And the bottom of this tree has four European varieties. Chasselin, Biolo, Pinot Noir, Syrah, which are clustered together with Georgian varieties. So 
So that was really interesting to see that they probably came from Georgia through a route to Central Europe and not from southeastern Turkey. So both places played a great role in what we have today in Western Europe. And here another, another work uh, in Georgia done by uh, Georgian people. These are W is wild and C, V is cultivated and they are all mixed together. Well, probably they did not use a lot of DNA markers and it, we could make a criticism of that, but they mix all together. So there is also this Shula Verigora where they have found these pips um, and these vessels, 7000 BC. So it remains a candidate, a serious candidate. And also maybe Armenia, which later on, three or 4,000 BC, they found this uh, cave that Patrick was showing before, where we, we have evidence of wine making as far as 4,000 4, BC with pips, with uh, grave remains uh, and stuff like that. So this whole area is the birthplace of wine and wine culture. So now I move on to the evolution of grape varieties. And for this, I have to show you my last baby. This is Wine Grapes, a book that I wrote together with Julia Harding, Jensis Robinson. Uh, it's out October 25th, uh, the UK edition, and November 6th, the US edition. I brought both of them to show the difference, but the content is the same, only the cover is different. And basically everything that I just told before is found in the introduction of the book. Um, and it contains all the details, the genetic details, the historical details for 1,368 grape varieties that are cultivated in the world to make commercial wine. We have tried to gather all of them in one book, which is very heavy, uh, 1,280 pages. Um, and it, it took four years in the making. So you ha you, you're welcome to come and not take this away, but just consult this. And it's not promotion, advertisement, or marketing. It's just information. You have some flyers here if you want to know more about the book. And we have a website, winegrapes.org, where you can find information and you can find links to order the book. Um, the price is a little bit high. It's 120 pounds. But you can have it for 78 uh, through Amazon. So. Hurry up, it's uh, until December, hurry up. So it's a nice crisp Christmas gift. End of promotion. So in this book you will find information about all that and also about the birth of a grape variety. I, we, we can ask the question, what is a grape variety? Some people would smile at this, but the answer is not so obvious. Because if you ask uh, a grower, what is Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris? He will say, these are three varieties. And I say, no, it's one single variety that I call Pinot, which, has, which had some mutations, some accidents in his long life. And once it turned gray and once it turned white. But it's the only difference. The rest is the same. When I do a DNA, DNA profile of the three, I get the same result. So basically, it's the same grape that had some mutations. Because at the birth of any grape variety, you have a grape seed. A grape seed that grows to a plant which is propagated through cuttings or layering, and through pro propagation. Um, Pinot has been propagated probably for 2,000 years, so it has plenty of time to accumulate mutations. Some mutations have no effect, you don't see them. Some have spectacular effects, like grape color, like berry color, but also the, berry, the, the, the cluster size, maybe the maturity, uh, it's early or late ripening, um, maybe some shape of leaves, some hairs under the leaves, stuff like that. So every time we observe one of these differences, we say it's a clone. And the, the totality of the clones, all the clones together, are the grape cultivar. And at the beginning, there is always a father and a mother. So every grape variety has a father and a mother. And every time that it is possible in this book, you will find the pedigree, the geneal genealogy of the grape variety, because every grape variety has a father and a mother. Uh, it contains, by the way, 300 DNA results that are, have not been published anywhere else, only in this book. And this is one thing that I'm, I'm the most proud of, is the 
pedigree reconstruction of 156 grape varieties of Western Europe that are linked together by direct parent-offspring relationships. Uh, of course, you cannot read it, but just to show you that you can see it in our book, um, all the relationships between these grapes, and three of them are very important. This is Savagnin, which is Tramina, Savagnin Blanc, or Gevius Tramina. Once again, all these names are the same variety. I don't like to speak about the, the Savagnin family or the Pinot family. It makes no sense for me. It's, the, it's one single grape that had many mutations. Gevius Tramina is a color plus aromatic mutation of Savagnin, nothing else. So these are important grapes. Gué Blanc, maybe you've heard of that. It has become famous a few years ago. I'll, I'll explain later. And Pinot. These are the three most important in this pedigree because they have given birth to a lot of what we cultivate and what we, we drink today in Western Europe. For example, Savagnin gave birth to Grüne through a very nice story because it is an, uh, an old vine that has been rescued near Eisenstadt um, with no name. And the place was St. Georg, so it has become St. Georgener. And the father of Grüne existed in only one single plant. I visited this in June, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, sadly, it has been vandalized a few years ago, so now you have a fence around and you need to ask to enter and to see the plant. But it's fascinating that the father of Grüne Wettliner, which, which is, by the way, an excellent grape variety from Austria, the father or the mother uh, is one single plant that could have died without no one, not, uh, no one seeing it. Uh, almost the same goes for Silvana, which has Österreichisch Weiss as a parent, which was, was a forgotten, obscure variety. Uh, Savagnin is also the parent of Chenin Blanc, of the Loire, and also of Sauvignon Blanc. And probably all of you know this uh, parentage of Cabernet Sauvignon. It is um, natural, spontaneous cross between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. If you follow this, you have Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, and here Savagnin. Savagnin is a great, uh, is a grandfather of Cabernet Sauvignon. Who would have told that? Who would have guessed that? So it is fascinating to, to go through this pedigree and see the relationship and maybe try to find the relationship in a glass of wine. Um, this is another tree that has been made by Miles and colleagues, which is really interesting and it, it, it has the same conclusions with this S&P technique. And also, Tramina is a very important variety, Pinot Noir as well. Unfortunately, it was based on the, um, the uh, grape collection uh, in Geneva, in New York, and they do not have Gué Blanc. Sadly, they do not have Gué Blanc. Otherwise, it would be somewhere here in the middle, very important. Gué Blanc has more than 80 offspring in Western Europe. This is a map of all of, the, all of them that I created, trying to put the grape variety uh, at its right place. And some of them are very important. If you think of Riesling, Riesling is a progeny of Gué Blanc. Elbling as well. Furmint, the grape of Tokai, is a progeny of Gué Blanc. Blaufränkisch, the important red variety of uh, Austria, is also a progeny, and so on. So we have many, many uh, offspring of Gué Blanc that are still cultivated in Western Europe. So I call it the Casanova of the grape variety because it has children in, any, in every country of Western Europe. Maybe you've heard of that, it's a bit old, it's 1999, made by um, my uh, former professor Carol Meredith at UC Davis and her PhD student uh, John Bowers, who found that Pinot and Gué Blanc have crossed at least 16 times to produce 16 grape varieties in northeastern France, um, among which we find Chardonnay, Gamay, Aligoté, Melon, Melon, which is um, responsible for Muscadet in the, in the Loire. So if you think about that, Chardonnay and Gamay have the same parents. They are brother and sister, simply. So it's interesting when, when, you, when you look at the grapes and you see the, the uh, homology in the morphology, it's really interesting that are uh, all brothers and sisters. And this is, uh, well, one of, the, one of the papers that I published in uh, 2006. 
and I used a um, probabilistic approach. It was very complicated. I lost some neurons uh, during that uh, because it was a lot of statistics to show that Pino is most likely a great-grandfather of Syrah. If you go this, Syrah, uh, we know that it is a spontaneous cross, a progeny of Mondes Blanche from Savoie and Dureza from Ardèche. And this Dureza turned out to be a brother of Teroldego. Teroldego is a grape variety from Trentino, northern Italy. So it was the first time that we, we could find a genetic link between, I mean, across the Alps. So that was very interesting. Teroldego also gave Marzimino and Lagrine, which are brothers, and this is cultivated in Alto Adige, Sud Tyrol. Marzimino in Lombardia and also Trentino. So we have all this geographic place uh, in northern Italy where these grapes are related. And they are all related to Pinot, which is at the top. And probably that Pinot is a great-grandfather of Syrah, which is really interesting because we have always thought that Syrah and Pinot and all the grape varieties that we have were introduced from somewhere in the, in the Near East or somewhere, uh, each at one time. But we think that it's not the case. We think that they all have uh, a common ancestor and it challenges their assumed independent origins. So, with this idea, uh, I, I'll come back later, with this idea, we have uh, selected a limited number of founder varieties that have given birth through, through natural crossings to almost all the grapes that we cultivate and we drink today. And I just named them. You already know Gouet, Savagnin, and Pinot in northeastern France, where they had a lot of progeny. You already know Teroldego, which is a very important, but you probably don't know, or little, uh, uh, very few people of you would know Rez, which is a grape variety from the Alps in Switzerland, which gave birth to many other grapes. Nebbiolo, of course, Lulienga in Piemonte, Mondeuse, Mondeuse Blanche or Mondeuse Noir, who gave some progenies, Garganega in Veneto, Tribidrag. So this is, this is our choice in the book to use the, um, the name of the variety that is used in the country of origin. And Tribidrag, maybe you've never heard of this name, is nothing else than Primitivo or Zinfandel. So you can read the story of Tribidrag through Primitivo and Zinfandel in the book because it comes from Croatia. So uh, it is also a founder variety because it gave birth to Plavac Mai, which is the most cultivated variety in Croatia today. Muscablon à petit grain, which comes probably from Italy or Greece, we're not sure, is very important. Cabernet Franc gave birth not only to Cabernet Sauvignon, but also to Merlot and uh, other, other grapes. And Cayetana Blanca, which is from the Iberian Peninsula, also called uh, Morisco in Portugal or Pardina, also in Spain. It has many, many different names. All these grape varieties are very old and have a lot of synonyms, uh, and which means that they are very important founder varieties. So my conclusion is that grapevine was domesticated in the Near East, no question. Possibly Eastern Turkey, which is the most plausible, most likely hypothesis based on uh, genetics, archaeology, and linguistic, but Georgia and Armenia remain candidates, maybe secondary domestication centers, or maybe the three of them have domesticated the grapevine. Uh, we can see with all these crossings, natural crossings, that for now we have only um, a limited number of possible genetic com combinations between the grape varieties because they used to cross each other in the same geographic area. Now you can take uh, Hatsiteli from Georgia and cross it with a, I don't know, with a um, Chardonnay. They should not meet naturally, but you can do it and maybe the result is interesting. Nobody has tried this yet. And the obscure grape, grape varieties, and they are, there are some outside, only one word, save them, drink them. That's the best way. If you don't drink them, people will not plant it, will not cultivate it. So we have to keep this uh, fascinating heritage of grape varieties. So I use this uh, picture of Patrick, uh, maybe like him, he's tasting Midas Touch, but there is no Midas Touch. I hope you will enjoy tasting outside, and I thank you for your attention.